today I want to talk about food across borders. Um, really the concept more than the book, but I'm going to draw some examples from the book. Um, this was a labor of love and it kind of uh, captured the work that Melanie, Dawn, and I were doing in different um, areas of academia. I'm a historian, Melanie's a sociologist, and Dawn is a geographer. Um, our objective was to find really the cutting edge of um, scholars that are working on the issue of food crossing borders. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of what that looks like. Myself, I had been doing that work in terms of immigrants coming to the United States. And this was a kind of personal uh, exploration because I come from a Mexican father. Um, my grandparents traveled throughout California uh, harvesting vegetables. Uh, my father actually ended up owning a, a carniceria, or a meat market, and I grew up cutting meat. So food has been a really integral part of my life. Um, and uh, as you know from my title, I'm doing Latino studies. So um, I was really interested in the, new, the next generation, and food studies has been a very popular subject. Um, it is probably the most popular class that I teach at Dartmouth. Uh, and um, so there's uh, a lot of students that are very interested in it. And I think today also there's a kind of focus on local movements and, and local foods. Um, and what Melanie and Dawn and I were noticing is that while there's a kind of almost fetish of the local, um, and I am guilty of that as well, um, we, at, we do that at the risk of ignoring the majority of the ways that most of us eat in this country and actually, and actually in this world, and that is that we get our food that comes into this nation from beyond, right? Travels many miles. Um, and that is especially true of people that are not of a privileged background like myself that teaches at Dartmouth. So we really want to focus on the, the issue of the ways in which most of us get our food. We wanted to appreciate um, the immigrants that bring that food to us, but also the ways in which those immigrants uh, bring their own cuisine and start to transform our society. Um, so we've gone from hot dogs and hamburgers being the quintessential American food to now tacos, right? And I'm going to talk about why those transitions have happened. And it has a lot to do with the way that food gets to us. I also just want to uh, acknowledge that crossing borders is a messy thing. And it produces conflicts, and it produces um, anger in some cases, and some resentment. And so I want to kind of push through those questions, but I also want to entertain them in, in the aftermath of, of my talk tonight. So I know that it's, it can be a difficult topic. But let's start with the issue of um, philosophy, really, and history to some extent. So Thomas Hobbes and the Leviathan, this image comes with um, his, his famous uh, book, um, argued that kings did not rule on the basis of divine right, but they, they did it on an agreed upon uh, social contract which individuals consented to by joining together under the sovereign or the king. Hobbes called this the body politic. And I think in many ways, the nation is an embodiment of all those individuals. And one of the main things that the sovereign had to do was to ensure access to sustenance or food. Right? That is the kind of quintessential, uh, very uh, basic thing that governments are supposed to do. Um, this kind of issue right, leads to uh, the creation of unique cuisines, um, because the way in which a society gets, it food, gets its food and prepares its foods begins to define that nation. And so French cuisine, of course, is uh, a very important element of being French. Right? And it's tied up in the politics of um, how food comes to us. Emile Durkheim, who is a sociologist, uh, saw this in the Republic of, of France. So moving from monarchies to republics, this continued to be an issue. Um, so the French sociologist Emile Durkheim envisioned the French Republican nation as a group of individuals in solidarity with each other through a mutual dependence. This understanding of society became the foundation of a modern concept of the nation and nationalism. And while the system changed from a monarchy to a republic, the concept of bodily health through governance remained. In our own country, 
we see this in terms of the metaphors we use. So during the 1920s, or excuse me, not the, the, yes, the 1920s and 30s, we saw bread lines come up, and that became the symbol of the Depression, right? Um, in addressing that uh, uh, challenge, Herbert Hoover, the president, right, he promised a chicken in every pot in 1928. And then it was uh, Franklin Roosevelt that came in and instituted the food stamp uh, program um, in 1939 through World War II, and it, and it came back to us in 1961 and is continuing to be a, a part of our society. So I think the point that we're trying to make, um, and I'm trying to make, is that food is an elemental and essential part of what government does, and it really defines uh, who we are as a people. And I think we can see this uh, moving forward into uh, the period that we're in today, right? The common question that we get is, are we what we eat? And we think about that in a national sense, right? Um, so if you take my example of hot dogs and hamburgers to tacos, what does that say about us? I think it signals that we've changed in terms of our demography and, and how Mexican people and Latinos more broadly influence who we are. I think the more important question, given how dynamic the United States is as a population, and that it depends on immigration, what happens if we are constantly changing, right? That is to say, um, there is a wave of, of immigrants that have come, uh, Irish immigrants in the early uh, 20th century, Italian immigrants to some extent, right? Um, but moving more uh, to the pr present time, we're looking at Latinos and Central Americans today. How are they changing our food, but also how are they changing who we are as a people? And this became a lightning rod during the 2016 election. And maybe you remember a lot of things about that election. And I was just turning off my car and the uh, impeachment hearings, right? <laughs> but um, President uh, Trump made this an issue as a candidate, right? Where um, he actually, uh, I don't know if you remember this part, but he had a, a Latino surrogate who was going around saying that taco trucks were the bane of the United States' existence. And he actually had to walk that back because so many people are attached to their tacos, right? And so Trump kind of switched it up and uh, became an advocate for fast food, number one. So we talked about the virtues of Wendy's and, and, uh, and, and the like. McDonald's as well, but also his own um, uh, taco bowl that he serves in his Trump Tower, right? So this became a very important part of uh, his campaign, and uh, needless to say, he didn't appeal to too many Latinos, um, but uh, it, it is, I think, a symbol of the ways in which food plays a part in politics today, right? By the way, I've written about this, um, uh, this incident, and uh, in that, in an interview with CNN, Trump said, "I, I think you'd be you're better off going th uh, going to McDonald's or Wendy's than some place you have no idea where the food is coming from." And so, just the kind of mass production was something that he thought was a good thing. Right? I don't want to spend too much time on Donald Trump. <laughs> what I do want to do is talk about. Um, my own background. So one of my fondest memories was um, growing up with my father owning a, a carniceria or a meat market in Azusa, California, about 40 miles from the center of uh, metropolitan Los Angeles. We go about three or four in the morning, um, well ahead of when we opened the market at eight, to collect the fruits and vegetables that came from all over the world at this point, right, in the 1980s. And I would go with my father and we, did, we, we owned that market for 13 years, and, and it was during the years of the mid-'80s through um, the mid-'90s, right? This was a time of incredible change, uh, particularly in Los Angeles, but all over the United States. Um, this was a period of time where immigrants were coming in very large numbers. Um, in Mexican-American history, we often talk about the 1920s as the creation generation. That's when my great-grandfather came. But in fact, um, more Latinos came in the 1980s, um, really starting in the 70s, and then 
uh, peaked in the 80s and 90s. So what we saw was a real transformation in the kinds of foods that were coming in, partly because that LA market, which is enormous, right, was feeding that population. And so there was increased amount of mangoes, there was increased amount of papayas. These were things that were foreign to me growing up. I was born in 1968. So the 70s, we didn't see these things. And so we started to find this being represented in the LA market. We'd bring them back to our customers. And that place was uh, carne, the carniceria, which I call the carniceria. The neighborhood uh, called it a meat market um, in the 1950s and 60s when the predominant uh, community uh, or, or population of the community was white working class, right? But by the 1980s, it became mostly Mexican American and Central Americans were starting to come in, right? So we changed the name from Frontier Meats to, we just called it the Carneceria, right? My grandmother uh, would make menudo, which is a um, soup made from a pig, or excuse me, a cow's tripe, uh, the lining of a cow's stomach. And we would sell it, right? And pretty soon, we had our customers saying, well, why aren't you carrying mangoes and papayas and all of those wonderful things that come from Latin America, right? So it really started to change um, not just uh, um, our concepts of what was uh, capable of being sold there, but it started to change the identity of the market, OK? So this LA market was an incredible place. I would go there. And what we'd find is so many people um, uh, selling uh, products that uh, captured the new America, right? And I think it's really important to recognize that not just in, in our little frontier meats did we change, but this is a period of time when avocados started coming in great numbers, right? And so now, when we think about the Super Bowl, we think about guacamole, right? Um, and uh, these are ways in which we have evidence that our world was changing in dramatic ways. Um, today, half the mangoes uh, exported from Mexico's, Mexico are consumed in Los Angeles. Um, given that only one third of Euro-Americans have ever purchased the fruit, this market has appeared largely as a consequence of non-European immigrants who routinely consume the tropic, tropical fruit in their cuisines. Um, and over this period of time um, that I'm talking about, mango consumption increased by um, 4,500% uh, in the United States, right? And particularly in Los Angeles. So it made possible a range of new uh, um, foods, um, including mango sticky rice, which I love. I don't know if you know Thai food, but I want to talk about Thai, right? That's my favorite uh, dessert. Um, because as the Latino population was booming, so were Asian populations. And those papayas and mangoes were also serving those communities. So Pad Thai, right? Um, look, Hanover is not known for restaurants. <laughs> if you go, the one place is at the Hanover Inn and, and Pine. It's a good restaurant. But the rest is pretty, pretty uh, forgettable, except uh, there is a, a very good Thai restaurant. And in fact, if you go down the way to White River Junction, the one restaurant there that everybody wants to go to is a Pad Thai restaurant. So Thai has become sort of the, it's, it's emerging. And I would say t Pad Thai is emerging as maybe the new taco, <laughs> right? The new, the new dish. Um, it's gotten so that whenever I go to a conference with colleagues, they say, oh, are we going to go for Thai again? Right? So Thai has become so, so popular. And I want to talk about why that is. And um, in the book, uh, there's uh, one of my, my former students from uh, University of Oregon. He's now a professor at University of uh, Levada, Nevada, Las Vegas, um, wrote, a book, uh, wrote an article called Chasing the Yum. So how many people know what yum is? Yeah. So yum is the flavor profile of Thai food. It's what makes Thai special, right? And it's very complex. That's, I think, one of the ways in which Thai is, is special. So it's a combination of salty, sour, sweet, uh, uh, excuse me, sweet, creamy, and spicy. So it's part taste, but it's also part texture, if you think about the creamy part of it, right? And it's very, very difficult to achieve. It's especially difficult to achieve when the Thai uh, immigrants started coming to this country. And they're one, one of the 
the, uh, the, most, the, the latest uh, Asian immigrants. They started coming as students in 1965 to 1975. They were mostly going to Pacific uh, universities, and the one university they were going to is UCLA. Um, and they struggled to find this profile, right? And so the students started to think about, well, how are we going to get this interesting profile? And they found out that um, it, it was a part partly a problem of uh, the ingredients, right? Um, that they couldn't find them, that they, there was no LA market like I described in 1965 to 1975. But there was a citrus experiment station at the University of California, Riverside, about 60 miles away. And they found out that they were selling uh, kefir citrus. Now the kefir leaf is a very important component of Thai food, and they would break in after it closed, and they would just pick the leaves and then bring it back to LA and start cooking these Thai dishes on campus and selling them from st street carts to their fellow students. And that's how Thai food really got going in Los Angeles, right? But that was not a reliable source, right? Um, it also involved, you know, breaking the law. <laughs> So there's a, a number of ingredients, I think, that um, are really important. Mark makes this argument about creating um, the Thai profile, right, and the Thai community. Um, those necessary ingredients, of course, are students. I think it's important to recognize that the United States empire was important. Part of the reason why Thai came here is because of the Vietnam War, okay? They were wrapped up in Southeast Asia, displaced, um, and coming uh, through U.S. presence. Um, entrepreneurs, who I want to talk uh, about in a second, but in combination with the changing trade relationships between the United States and the world. Now, after World War II, um, there was an attempt to uh, create better trade relations um, and to create the flow of goods and, and products uh, across the world. The General Agreement on uh, Tariffs and Trade, or GATT, was formed in 1947. And by 19, the 1960s, 80 nations and 80% of the world was involved in trade. So that's how we started to begin to get those flavors that I was talking about. But there was also still a lot of impediments to that um, trade. There was protectionism, right? There was an attempt to kind of sell things within a nation and to keep them out. And they, they would do those through um, um, putting up high tariffs. So it would take individuals in the Thai community, this growing community, that was now graduated from UCLA and integrating into um, uh, California and California society to um, go to the next level and become entrepreneurs, right? And so one of them is uh, Tillamunkal, who is a, a founding member of the food community in Los Angeles. Um, he created Bangkok Market, which sits in North Hollywood and is now the place where little Thai, uh, the little Thai community resides. And I wanted to just play for you um, something from NPR. Let me see if I can open it. There we go. I had it earlier. Sorry. There it is. is home to one of the largest Thai communities in the world. And today, Thai Angelinos begin celebrating a water festival called San Fran to mark the new year. Many of them will be shopping at Bangkok Market, the first Thai market in the U.S. And here's Nandalee Del Barco, paid a visit. At the Bangkok Market, you can buy temple bells and bowls for offerings for monks and so much more. The aisles are stocked with rows of fresh Asian produce, noodles, and fish sauce. There are coconut milks, curries, and imported sriracha, varieties of rice, brown, black, purple, jasmine, even the so-called forbidden rice. Because only the, the royalty in Asia could ever eat it, so... And you can get it here for how much? You get a five-pound bag for like four bucks. Jeff Tila shows us around the market where he grew up working before becoming a top chef. For four decades, his family's store has sold inexpensive ingredients key to Thai cuisine. He says many of California's best chefs have shopped there. 
This was the only place where they could get lemongrass, kefir lime leaf, curry paste, fish sauce, where they weren't getting gouged for it, A, B, they knew their suppliers. When I became a fine dining chef, that was my in. Everyone was like, oh, you're the kid who used to pack my groceries and deliver my stuff to my restaurant. Tila's parents opened Bangkok Market in 1972. His mother, Marasi Tila Kampanpur, says they moved to L.A. with the first wave of Thai immigrants in the 1960s. Usually we shop at Chinatown, so they don't have ingredients the, the way Thai food. So my husband saw the opportunity, so he decided that, oh, we should open a market right now. Bangkok Market soon became a de facto community center and a trading post. In the early days before they began importing items, the family asked friends immigrating here to bring cases of curry paste and fish sauce. They relied on California farms for produce that was only available in spring and summer. Tila says his family began growing vegetables themselves in the warmer climates of Mexico. And it was specifically two regions. It was Nayarit and Sinaloa. It, to this day, by the way, the majority of your Asian produce in the wintertime comes from there, and nobody knows this. My dad literally and carried seed. I don't know how legal it was back in the day, but uh... Bangkok Market is in a windowless beige building in East Hollywood, an area once home to rival street gangs. They were all trying to claim territory. But they left their market alone. Yep, because they shopped here. Their mom shopped here. Tila says the market has survived where others did not. So April 92, I was a senior in high school. The riots popped off. About 30 of us stayed here for three days straight, barricaded the doors with rice sacks, jumped on the roof with whatever guns we could bring just to defend our store. Today, to get ingredients from around the world, all sorts of people shop at the market. Asians, Latinos, hipsters, and exciting new chefs like Louis Tikaran, a Fijian, Chinese, Indian, Australian, who moved here to open the hot new restaurant EPLP. Tikaram chops lemongrass and other ingredients to make Southeast Asian dishes with ingredients he buys at the Bangkok market. I walked in the door and that intoxicating smell kind of hit me of all the beautiful, you know, produce and then I knew I knew I could get everything. Jasmine rice from Thailand was there, all my sauces were there, palm sugar, rock sugar, coconut sugar. It was the same grace of big restaurants that you can find Bangkok market. <laughs> like Chef Louis's intriguing menus, Bangkok Market has come to represent some of the most diverse flavors of Los Angeles. Mandalita Barco, NPR News. Okay, so a little story about that. So he describes this moment, right, in the 1992 riots. I'll never forget that because our store was also hit um, uh, in Little Azusa, but the, these riots were across the entire landscape. So I'll never forget that um, the, the community, as um, stores were burning, as there was a lot of uh, conflict, um, the, across the street was a Korean swap meet. And they were on the roof with semi-automatic guns and what have you. We didn't have guns. <laughs> we didn't need them, in fact, because um, there were a lot of star, uh, stores that got broken into and their storefronts broken. Ours was left alone partly because of our transformation from frontier meats to serving the community. So we were in a very working class community, very Latino community. And the Latino community respected us because, one, we were Mexican. But the Central Americans also respected the fact that we were bringing in the things that they depended on. right? And so we had this incredible relationship with the community. Um, I would say the same thing's true of Tillamunkle and uh, Bangkok Market. He did talk about guns on the roofs, but um, I don't think he needed them because he was such an important part of that community in North Hollywood. So I think it's worth underscoring that this did not happen without that entrepreneur, without Jet's father, who'd started doing this in 1971, right? And began to get ahead of the free trade movement and be ahead of NAFTA, right? NAFTA comes in 1994, but he's actually going down to Mexico. He's contracting with, um, Growers in Sinaloa, and, uh, and he mentions there's some evidence, too, they were in Baja. But bringing those uh, um, products up and saying to the Mexican growers, look, we know you don't know what this is, but we're going to sell a lot of it. Please do it. And he proved them right, right? Not only did he make them wealthy, but he also created a community. 
right, that was based in food. And in fact, that is the foundation of the Thai American food that we eat today and Pad Thai, right? So this little market and this entrepreneur made all that happen. And it was this interesting connection between Mexican producers, um, Thai Americans in North Hollywood, and all the people that are eating this, right? And now what we see in these Asian markets, it's not just Bangkok market, is that it's serving new Asian communities and new Latino communities. And they're all depending on these markets, right? So I think it's a fascinating story. And by the time NAFTA comes along, um, Tillamunkle and uh, the Bangkok market is able to really leverage that uh, new trade regime and the redu reduction of uh, um, tariffs to maximize their potential, right? So I would say that the emergence of NAFTA helps spread Thai food to places like Hanover and White River Junction that I started talking about, right? But you're probably saying, well, that's LA. If you've ever been to LA, it's so diverse. You can eat anything. You have so many different communities. What does this have to do with Vermont? Well, um, not just the Thai restaurant in White River Junction, right? Um, I think we also need to recognize that we have this phenomenon of food crossing our borders in different ways. And I think it has a lot to do with um, the main industry of Vermont, which is agriculture, right? There's no state that depends on agriculture more in terms of the gross state uh, product um, than Vermont. 50% of our uh, income comes from agriculture, right? So we're an intensely agricultural state, but that is a uh, occupation that is falling out of favor with many Vermonters and many Americans, right? So if we actually look at the recent agricultural census in 2019, just in, in April, uh, what we see is the average age of farmers is 59.4%, uh, excuse me, 59.4 um, or close to 60, right? That's up a year, so it was 58 in 2012, the last time they did the census. Um, there's a 2% increase of farmers under the age of 35, but um, that has something to do with uh, young idealist uh, type farmers that are coming from um, school and saying, I want to join the food movement, right? So that, that's a good thing. But there's more farmers, there's an increase in farmers over 65, right? And we know that this is a problem, particularly in Vermont, because uh, farmers are having a hard time finding people to work the land and work their, their farms. Right. They're also having a, uh, some trouble in terms of secession. Who are they going to pass the farm to? And so we have a lot of farms closing. Another thing I just want to point out since we're on the topic, um, the, the census tells us that more women are getting into farming. Right. So what's a really interesting thing is that um, since 2012, we, we're up 28% uh, in terms of women farmers. Um, and women as principal operators are up 70%. But one thing that has remained constant, at least um, uh, at first glance, is that racially it is a predominantly white occupation, right? And that is absolutely true of Vermont and New Hampshire as well across the, the river from, from me. Um, and these in, in, in many ways become the butt of jokes on Saturday Night Live where they talk about the whitest states in, uh, in the union, right? But I think those characterizations um, hide something that's really important um, to the main industry of Vermont, uh, which is uh, Vermont's dairy industry, right? If you look at agriculture in Vermont, I mean, the one that is supreme and important to that uh, uh, economic engine is dairy. And if we look very closely, we see some of the kind of telltale signs that I was talking about in terms of decline. So um, there's increased consolidation and industrialization of the dairy industry. So we've decreased from 11,000 dairies in 1940 to fewer than 1,000 in 2012. That was the last um, census. I'm not sure what it is today, but this comes from a book that I'm going to talk about and an author in the book, um, Food Across Borders. Currently, we're around 687 dairies um, as of April 2019, right? So there's amazing uh, kind of attrition here that's going on. The only reason why it's actually surviving is immigrants, right? Um, and and I'll, I can talk about different industries that this is happening uh, where immigrants are essential. One is the thoroughbred industry in Kentucky, 
right? It's um, immigrants, particularly Latino, who have still a relationship to animals, raising animals, coming and working, um, not just for uh, lower wages, right? But it's the expertise that they bring. They have this relationship. It's still a very viable way of life in Mexico and Central America. So they bring those, the, that knowledge and they have that love of working with animals. And that's absolutely true of the, of the milk industry in Vermont. So 68% of Vermont's milk comes from dairies employing migrant laborers with a yearly sale of $320 million, translating 43% of New England's milk supply. So this is not uncontroversial. Um, I find myself sometimes, well, I've actually kind of retired from social media. <laughs> but when I was, uh, and I hosted a conference at Dartmouth called um, Cows, Land, and Labor, which we looked about at all these issues of uh, the challenges of um, livestock agriculture and immigrants. Um, and, you know, there's this kind of celebration of the family farm. I'm also a family farmer, I would say. I think it's a very virtuous thing. But the reality is, those demographics tell you that a family cannot do it, right? It's impossible. It either takes a very heavy investment of uh, mechanical milking uh, and technology, or it takes attracting immigrants here. So immigrants started coming here as temporary guest workers um, or H2A workers. But if you know anything about that, they can only be here for six months. And if you know anything about dairy, it's a 24-7 uh, all the, all the time uh, type occupation, right? So you really have to have these immigrants. So what's unique about Vermont farm work from a Latino's point of view, okay? It's unforgiving work schedules, um, but that's not true just for Latinos. It's true for uh, everybody that does this work. It is a rural environment. That actually appeals to Latinos in many ways. They enjoy being in this environment. But they also don't have transportation often, right? And when you take the rural environment and no transportation and you add to it the kind of racial homogeneousness, uh, homogene homogeneity of Vermont or New Hampshire, they stick out like a sore thumb, right? They're easily identified. And in fact, in the world that we uh, uh, exist in right now, where immigrants are being maligned and uh, uh, challenged, right? And I found this on social media. That's why I pulled back a little bit, right? I got sick of defending um, the, these workers. Um, it makes it really tough, right? Um, it also makes it tough to eat the kind of foods that um, they are uh, used to. So think about the Bangkok entrepreneur um, who is able to kind of put this together. But you can't do this if you're working um, all the time on a dairy farm and you're not making a lot of money and what money you make you're sending to sustain a family in Mexico or Guatemala, right? That's what's happening to these workers. And most importantly, and I think uh, this is, speaks to the heart of the issue I want to talk about in a second here, which is organizing these um, farm workers, um, there's a fear of border enforcement. Why would you say, well, they're all the way up here in Vermont, the, the border's way down there. In fact, what happened after 9-11 is that the um, Customs and um, Border Patrol created, actually it was Congress that created, a surveillance zone of 100 miles of any border in the United States, right? So that includes the coastal areas, is fair game for ICE to, serve, to do surveillance for immigrants, right, who are undocumented. Within 25 miles, they can go on private property and arrest, right? So if you actually take that big uh, national uh, map, and so this is the 100 mile and this is the 25 mile, and you look at Vermont, half of it is in that 100 miles. And then if you look at where most of the dairies are in Vermont, Franklin, right, Grand Isle, Orleans, in that 25 mile zone, right? So it's not just being Latino and sticking out like a sore thumb in a very homogenous state, right? But it's also the kind of surveillance that we've been living with, or they, more importantly, live with um, since 9-11. Okay, so it's not 
you know, your ordinary kind of immigrant work experience. Um, and uh, this is because uh, of the kind of geopolitical transformations that have happened. Um, and uh, I think it's important then to recognize a few questions that we should ask of our food source here in Vermont. So what are the conditions that make Vermont an appealing and threatening place for Latino uh, immigrants? And what are immigrants and their advocates doing to lessen that threat? So one of the people that we published, her first publication on this topic was Teresa Morris. It's in the book, Food Across Borders. And she went on and uh, published a book just this year called Life on the Other Border. And it captures all of these struggles. It also captures um, a program that she's tried to uh, help address in terms of uh, the, the lack of foods or culturally specific foods that these Latino immigrants have by empowering them and enabling them to grow their own food. So if they can't find their chilies or they can't find um, their tomatillos, right, they can do it themselves working with the farmers that would set aside a plot of land and it's called the Huertas program. So one of the testimonies in her book by Gloria, she doesn't name any of them because of the surveillance issue, right? Um, she says, and thanks to the programs that you started, Huertas, because of this, we have more of the foods that we need to make our dishes. So they may not have a Bangkok market <laughs> for Latinos in Vermont, but they do have this program that's enabling them to eat um, the chilies that are unique to their culture. But Robert, another person that she interviewed for the book, said the real issue for food, um, and this may not be part of your study, but as you know, the work situation is horrific. Right? So this is one of the things that she wants uh, to try to draw our attention to. Okay? And in the book, she captures the formation of a group called Migrant Justice. Right? So Migrant Justice is working with Ben and Jerry's. Uh, maybe you've heard of the Milk with Dignity program. Um, and this is a model that's really not a union, right? It's an it's a opportunity to basically um, uh, make sure that farmers uphold their under the bargain and honoring these immigrants that are making their lives and their dairies and their businesses uh, successful by taking a penny per 100 gallons and creating a monitoring system to make sure that the living conditions are fair, um, that uh, they are being treated um, fairly, and that they're also getting paid a living wage, right? So migrant justice uh, has been important to their survival, and I think in many ways honoring their commitments uh, to the farmers and to Vermont in terms of the kind of um, importance that they have in our economy. Um, and if you've gone, I'm not sure if there's a Hannaford's on this side, right? But there is a Hannaford right here, okay. Uh, but Hannaford's is now the latest company that Migrant Justice is trying to get on board, and you might have seen picketing, but that's as a, 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 conse is a, yeah, as a consequence of um, trying to extend that program that is now hopefully moving from Ben and Jerry's to other um, suppliers of milk. We'll see what happens. Okay. So I want to wrap up and just say that um, through this book project and through these examples, um, we learn that first our food crosses borders, and we like it that way. We like our tacos. We like our pad thai. It has become a national phenomenon because it is good food, right? And it has changed us in many ways for the better. It's made our palates more flavorful, I think. Second, our worldly palates are a consequence of immigration. Right? So um, immigrants are not to be maligned, in my opinion, um, that they are the source of first new foods, so talking about those mangoes and papayas and avocados, that then become these staples uh, that we rely on, such as tacos, mango sticky rice, and pad thai. Right? And who knows what else is coming, pho and Vietnamese uh, immigrants. Right? So that's also a, a consequence of this immigration. And finally, our economies, just like Vermont, depends on people and food crossing borders. So it's not just the food that comes in, but it's those people that come from those places outside of the United States to come and cultivate foods that are familiar to us, like milk or cheese. 
and that those immigrants are equally important and included in this concept of food across borders that I think we need to think about whenever we sit down and eat um, at a restaurant or even at home. So with that, I'll stop and I'll take questions. Thank you. <laughs>